Okay, hi. Right. I'm going to go ahead and um, start here while I'm waiting to see if we'll get some people um, showing up for the help session. Um, so I did want to kind of go over assignment three today. Oh, there was an announcement. Um, we might be needing to change the format of these class sessions. So, so read that. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, go ahead and email me. Um, let me know. Um, so uh, let's see here. Oh, let me share my screen before I get going. Um, yeah, so looking at um, our schedule of activities for the coming um, um, next couple of uh, weeks or so. So we, we do have one more. Um, um, unit here uh, before our first test. So we're going to be looking at logistic regression classification. That's really kind of this week. Um, and then we do have a whole week next week, uh, which will be set aside for reviewing for the test and things. So um, probably on our next um, class session, um, um, I'll talk more in detail about uh, what we're going to do on the test and see if anybody has any questions about things they got to review and stuff like that. So, but it'll basically be over the stuff that we've looked at so far, which is kind of an intro to Python, um, getting um, the, uh, the, the learning about the scientific uh, Python libraries and scikit-learn, and then kind of the, the beginning, the basics of machine learning. So particularly learning how uh, linear regression and Logistic regression works, although we're going to be looking at logistic regression this week. So, um, so I see I got uh, two things here. Oh, this one. Sorry about that. Um, um, so, yeah, I've got a lot of stuff that I kind of want to review on assignment three. So, there's a lot of good things on there. Um, so let me go ahead and bring that up um, and talk about that. Um, probably we'll spend most of the class kind of going over that. So this will be a good review of the stuff that we should have learned about uh, linear regression and um, some of the things um, about actually building machine models. Um, so, you know, so, so there's a lot of good sort of practical things in the assignment that we just finished here um, on building uh, machine models and um, uh, fitting them well and uh, and also determining whether you know whether they're performing well or not okay so so the the testing and validation of the models and things like that so. um all right so the the notebook i posted and i, I encourage you to look at that has, has a lot more of a detailed discussion so um you should um um, download that notebook and, and take a look at it. Uh, I'm going to go through it here kind of in detail. Um, so first of all, um, actually at, at the top of the notebook, um, I showed the uh, function that we use to actually generate the data. Okay, so this is the actual polynomial function. That, that we got kind of the, the secret function. So, you know, these were the, the parameters for x to the power zero, x to the power one. So five, four, five, um, negative one, negative two, six, plus uh, a little bit of uh, Gaussian noise that was added to each um, data point, right? So that was the true function that was actually generated. So it was actually a, um, um, a fifth degree polynomial um, um, you know, so there's powers of one through five plus the bias term. So, so six parameters in total uh, were actually governing um, 
how this function worked. Um, so if you're interested, actually, you know, this is the same. This is pretty similar to um, some of the um, um, uh, fake data that we generated for our uh, lecture notebooks the previous week as well. So it's, it's the same idea. Um, um, although in this case, we were using a function um, and we generated, uh, we reused the polynomial feature to actually generate the features. Uh, but then added some noise in there. So, so this is adding um, um, random noise um, with a range from like zero to three here. So, um, oh, actually, yes, yeah, so and not Gaussian noise, but uh, but uh, uniform noise. Um, so now I'm wrong. So so um, in is is normal noise. So this will be no. This will be noise with a, a normal distribution. Um, so with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one, and then by multiplying by 0 0.3, we kind of we scale it. So it has more like a standard deviation of 0 0.3. Um, and then we're just adding that um, on to each one of the M data points, you know, um, which was a hundred that you were given in this. All right. So, you know, you didn't know for this assignment what the true function is. So, so here I'm plotting, um, uh, the actual data that I gave you um, um, as um, scatter plot points, and then the red is the true function um, that was used to generate this data with some noise added to it, right? But technically, this is a fifth degree polynomial, although the um, uh, the higher order terms were relatively small, so it looks pretty um like like a power three so, so there's not a whole lot of excessive wiggling at least not within this range here so so mostly looks like a a third or fourth power polynomial here for the most part um, there aren't any um smaller kind of oscillations in here or, or things like that right um So all I was looking, all I was looking for on part one, you know, was just to load the data and, and basically kind of do that that plot the same way there, right? So uh, maybe do a little bit of data exploration. So you know, um, um, maybe describe the data. So in this case, you know, uh, description helps us kind of see the range of the data. You know, so it, it ranges um, from three to nine that we're trying to predict. Um, and uh, I mean, the, the, the values on input are going from, you know, basically negative one to one or, or close to it, right? Um, but you can see that when you plotted it out, if you, if you plotted it out correctly. Um, and I was looking for kind of a scatter plot here. So. Um, So for part two, you were asked to overfit a model, basically. So, so this was actually a degree five polynomial. And so it actually has six parameters. So if you, over, if you fit a model with, with a degree 20, um, um, potentially, potentially overfit, although later on I'll talk about this, I probably should have had you fit an even, uh, even larger number of, of degrees on the polynomial to get some true overfitting. Um, so I, um, if I do this assignment again, I might uh, modify that so that we get some clear overfitting here. So, so anyway, if, if you did it um, with a degree 20 polynomial, um, it should look something like this. So um, you can use the polynomial features um, to, um, uh, do a fit transform on the, the degree one data. So the data was just a single feature. The result of that should be uh, a new array with 20 features um, in it, right? So if we were to um, um, look at the, uh, the, the shape of that, um, let me go ahead and restart my kernel and just uh, rerun these one by one here. So. Thank you. 
run all those above that here. So, um, so, um, so as oops, misspelling on the name. There you go. So maybe it would have worked before. But, so, um, you know, the result of, of the polynomial features that, that I hope everybody understands after this assignment um, is um, that, the, you know, we have the original 100 data points that had just um, a single, um, um, uh, or had a single feature, right? So, so originally it was just uh, 100 by one column, basically. Um, so after doing the um, um, uh, transform using one of these polynomial features transformers, uh, we've now got 20 features. So we've got the, we should have the original feature, uh, which you can think of as X to the power one feature. Um, plus we got X squared, X cubed and so on, right? Uh, we talked a little bit about that um, in the lecture notebooks um, for the previous week, so. Um, So fitting uh, a linear regression um, is uh, relatively simple in this case. So, you know, if we just create a linear regression model, we could use all the defaults um, for our linear regression uh, instance, right? Um, so show the contextual help here. So, um, yeah, so we're, we're using a linear regression object, but uh, we're, we're leaving all the, the defaults. So, you know, we're, we're uh, setting fit intercept to be true. Um, 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 you know, which, which is, you know, if you set that to false, it, it won't assume that there's a bias term, right? So, so the, the intercept is the, is the, uh, the, the y-intercept or the bias term, basically. Um, and so on, yeah. Um, so anyway, the, the, the fit for this part two should have been relatively easy. And, and if you did that, of course, you should have gotten a um, um, fitted model with uh, an intercept term and um, 20, um, 20 coefficients here, right? So, so the coefficients, you got, you got a, a one coefficient for each one of the polynomial features uh, plus a 21st coefficient for the intercept term in this case, right? And we talked a little bit about why that is when, when we when we look at the very basics of how linear regression works, um, right? So, you know, if you're fitting like a single feature, uh, if you think of that as fitting a line, um, so, so we're doing we're doing nonlinear uh, regression here because we're we're adding in these uh, higher degree terms. But um, but go back and think about just having a single feature and fitting a line. So if you have a single feature, you end up with two parameters. You have to have the slope and the intercept to um, um, to specify the line, which is basically your model of of your fit of the data, right? So, you know, the same thing is, is happening conceptually here, but we had to have parameters for all of the 20 features and then one more for the intercept term. Um, okay. um, so if we plot this data, um, so here's my first thing that I'm going to mention about uh, people's work on assignment three. So, so uh, a couple of, of my, my uh, most frequent comments were really about visualizing data more than about you know, uh, fitting machine learning models and things like that. So, um, but um, whenever you're displaying a, a, um, a model that's, you know, some sort of a fit over data points, you need to display that as a line, not, not as, as scatter plot points again, okay? Because, I mean, this is representing the actual interpolation, the actual model, you know, where, where it would make predictions in, in a precise manner for every 
input feature X that we have, this is exactly the value that the model would be predicting for all of you, right? So, so it really should be a line plot and plotting all these things. Another thing is um, um, later on, um, but you know, you, you really, I'll talk more about this later, but whenever you have a plot, make certain that you have good limits um, so that you can understand the data that's being plotted there, right? So um, um, in this case, you know, if you, if you don't specify your Y limits because of the way my model is fitting, it makes it a little bit tougher to visualize what the data is doing because of the, um, uh, the extreme um, um, sort of predictions the model makes for points way over here when X is close to one, right? So that can, that can happen, you know, and, and again, you know, that this is definitely a sign of overfitting, right? So um, um, this model probably wouldn't do too good for, would be, would you be doing particularly bad for points that are really close to one here? Might be doing okay, most all the rest of the range, but right there is gonna be really unpredicting, um, un under, uh, predicting what, what the real value should be for points over here close to one or right at one. So, but anyway, I mean, you know, the, the, the general principle is understand your visualizations. You know, you're, you're trying to convey information whenever you're plotting data. So you need to make it so that, that the, the, the picture conveys the information that you want to hear. So, so by, by allowing this range to be so big, um, it it makes it so that we can't really see the details uh, of the model fit that we have in here, right? And, you know, and maybe, you know, in my example solution, I, I probably should have also, you know, you should always really be labeling your axes and, and, um, and I should have had um, a legend here. So, so um, I might have taken points off for people if we're not doing that, I should take some points off for myself on that. You know? so, so we really should, whenever you create plots, have your X label, um, although in this case, you know, it's really fake data. So really, you know, we don't have so much to say about what the um, X and Y axes are, are representing here. You know, X is just our feature and Y is just our output or label. Um, well, if I want to have a legend, uh, I need to um, um, put label items on my letter plot and on my um, plot. Oh, um, yeah, I should have had some some handles if I would have put the legend. Move the plot up above. Like so. Um, so yeah, I actually did have a label on there, but I, I just forgot to call a legend. Um, all right. So I've got one more thing to say about kind of visualizing visualizing data later on, more about Y limits again. So another example where I um, um, commented on a lot of students' um, plots, not being able to really tell anything from the plot that, that you were giving since you didn't change the range of the data. Um, Uh, don't know what happened to my all oh my text here. Um, 
Um, let me uh, reloading this here. Sorry, what I was doing. My bad, not too certain why we were. Okay. Um, So we run all those up to this point. I'm not too certain what I did before. I must have done something that was just hiding the hiding the, the text or something there. And um, uh, looks like it's still there, including my changes that uh, add in the legend to fix that and stuff. So, all right, um, so for um, part three then, uh, we got into, we talked a little bit about um, how you test your models. Uh, so how you validate whether they are, you know, generalizing well and making good predictions, right? Um, so, you know, uh, and again, this comes directly from the um, lecture notebook, so I didn't really have to do a whole lot, uh, just reuse some of the things um, on this particular assignment here. So in particular, you know, we're doing a type of cross-validation uh, when we plot these learning curves uh, here, um, where we uh, uh, split up our data into data we train it with, and then we test it on, on other data, although this is a, a, a slightly different kind of of, of cross validation in the plot learning curves, um, you know. Also, so we, we we split it up into just one data point and test it on the another ninety nine, and then to two and test on the other ninety eight, and so on. Right. So that, that was kind of what we were doing. Um, uh, that, that's a, a one way of generating these learning curves, like we talked about. Um, and there's another way that we'll later come across here. So. Um, Well, what that means then is um, you could um, use this function to do to plot these learning curves um, by building a pipeline that will correctly uh, transform the input features into a twenty degree polynomial. So as you were at, you were asked to to you know uh, do this again with a twenty degree polynomial function on part three here. Um, so again, I, I think most people have this fine, um, uh, at least you know, kind of uh, doing the, doing a pipeline that was that was uh, correct. Um, so in this case, you know, you have to have a pipeline that that, that first goes through a polynomial features transformer, um, and then feeds that into the linear regression um, um, to build a model. And then it, it, if you pass that pipeline into the plot learning curves. Um, it will, or it should correctly um, um, give you a plot of these learning curves, which, which is a, a kind of cross validation. You know, so again, where we're where we're starting by holding off just one data point and training with that data point and testing with the other nine. So in that case, you know, the the the, the trained data is one data point and the validation data point is ninety nine for for the first one. And then when it's ten here, what we're training with the, the first 10 data points and then we validate with the other night, right? So what most people should have had was something that looks like this, although uh, the, the comment that I gave, you know, again, if you didn't, you didn't uh, modify the range for the Y limits here, uh, you really can't tell very well what's happening here, right? So it looks like maybe it's, um, 
not overfitting too much or only on a very small range here. But but again, that's that's the, the, the scale. The y-axis is going up to 10 to the power 11. So it's really just squashing down all the details. You can't really see how long, you know, like, like whether there's any gap like over here when, when we're training with 60% of the data and validating with the other 40% other or stuff like that, right? So, so this visualization here really is kind of useless uh, for getting a feel whether we're overfitting or not. I mean, you, you really need to um, modify your range so um, um, you can see things better, right? So most people, if you did that, would get something like this, although, you know, if you rerun this, I mean, there is some random uh, randomization that goes on uh, in this case for um, for where these models start, right? So, so when we're doing th this function to plot the learning curve, when we're actually building uh, 80 different versions of the linear regression. So, so we're building and fitting uh, 80 different versions with different kind of starting conditions, right? So, so if you rerun this, um, um, you will get slightly different curves. And sometimes you can get it well where it will uh, kind of close the gap. Uh, especially down at the later point here, right? Which is an indication that it um, um, didn't do too bad, right? And, but here, the, 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 this is classic. If you saw stuff like this, um, um, it, it's really an indication of overfitting, right? So, you know, it, it performs well in the training data, but it, it does abysmally on the um, uh, data that we're validating with, with this cross-validation here. Um, and, and especially since it's, um, we still have kind of a gap over here when we're using a large amount of the training data, 60, 70%, right? But again, like I said, you, wouldn't, uh, you, you might not always see that gap uh, up here, um, which, you know, I, I wish I would have had people done this with a degree 50 model, um, so which would have made it even more likely to, to see um, examples of overfitting on the learning curves here or, or um, more often, right? So, so sometimes you get these to come down kind of close here once you get past 40 or 50% of the data or so. so. Um, all right, so you get it. That was another kind of common, just a visualization thing that I, that I commented on a lot of students, but other than that, I mean, most people were fitting this okay and, and were applying the learning curves, um, you know, reusing the function to plot the learning curves just fine here. Hopefully everybody's understanding what's happening here and why this is a kind of a type of validation or cross-validation. Although this isn't really, I should probably rename this. Um, 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 so when people talk about cross-validation, they usually mean where you, you split the data up into like, like say do a five-fold cross-validation, which means you split the data up into five as equal parts as you can. Um, and then you'll train five, the model five times where you'll train it with four of the five folds uh, and then validate it, you know, thus the cross-validation, validate it on the, the, the held back fold. And you do that five times, and then you usually you'll, you'll um, um, take the average of those five for a five-fold cross validation, and that's your um, that's your um, um, estimation using that uh, type of validation testing of how well the model is doing in generalizing. Okay. Um, all right, so I, that's, that's what I was basically, look, basically looking for on part three here. Um, and that you kind of display out your coefficients to the end. Probably should have been, I mean, most everybody, um, except for two or three people that were having some issues, not quite doing the fitting correctly here. Um, I think the most common issue is not really using the data quite right. So not using all the data set or, um, sometimes not using the, the pipeline, creating the problem when feature quite correct. Um, but, but for most all the models that we fit here, you're going to get an R squared score of 0.97 or so. so um, 
probably should have should have had you guys plot out the the, the root mean squared error scores um, for all of these as well. Okay. Um, and another thing I, sh I should probably mention here because we'll, we'll come up to it. Um, so um, inside of the function that I gave you, we we were um, basically gathering the mean squared errors. Okay, so. Um, um, and then um, for some reason, I can't quite remember on this function, I, I went ahead though, and took the square root of that. So, so it's really the root mean squared error, okay? So later on, I'm gonna do some things where I just use the, the, the mean squared error or the negative mean squared error, right? So, so um, I'm, I guess keep that in mind, maybe I should change the rest of, of the, the example solution here to always be using the root mean squared error, but uh, for reasons that we'll you know, mention later on here, it's easier to use the negative of the mean squared error um, for certain things, okay? But um, one thing about this overfitting is, uh, so one valuable thing about this um, that I should have mentioned before I move on um, is, you know, making a perform, make, making a note of the performance that you're getting, okay? So, so, so the model's overfitting, uh, but we've got some evidence that we ought to be able to get something like a, a point uh, a three or so. And actually, it's a bit less than point three. Um, so point two five, point two eight. Root mean square error, but we ought to be able to get the the, the that performance on the validation data to get down close to that if if we can get a good model. Okay, so that that's kind of a good target to keep in mind that. Um, Root mean square is around 0 0.25, 0 0.28, 0 0.3 um, are theoretically possible here, right? Because you know when we're overfitting, um, so, so this model might be modeling the noise too much, but um, um, uh, you know, so something that's this correctly building a model that's not modeling the noise is never going to be able to do any better than than yeah, than, than what we're doing here on 80% of the data. Um, that's probably, um, uh, you know, as, as the noise um, in, in um, the, you know, modeled in the parameters that it fit right there. Um, Okay. Yeah, I, I guess I discussed some of that stuff there here um, on this example solution. All right, so for the next two, uh, let's talk about regularization a bit. So, you know, um, um, this was kind of the topic of last week's uh, lecture materials and, and um, past materials. Regularization is a way to fight overfitting for a model. So it's, it's, it's a very common way. Um, and we talked about uh, L2 and L1 normalization right, in the machine learning uh, actually, kind of, in, in, this is really came from the people that were doing statistics before machine learning. Um, they called this ridge regularization for the L2 and the lasso regularization for the L1 kind of norm. And L2 and L1 norm is kind of from people that, from mathemat mathematics, uh, mathematicians, and kind of refer to those as L2 and L1 norms. It's a linear algebra um, thing there. So. Um, so, I was kind of hoping that I would see, um, I probably should have uh, made this more of a requirement here, but, but I, was, I was hoping people would explore some, tram, some, some different values of alpha by hand and try and come up with uh, a feeling for what a good value of you know what a good amount of normalization is right so, so remember that the normalization is controlled by the amount by the alpha parameter okay so this can range from down to zero uh, which means have no regularization so, so if you use an alpha of zero basically you're just doing regular uh, uh, linear regression you're not using any regular regularization but you can use values uh, up to one or two or even bigger right so so you can have values bigger than one for alpha, in which case you'll be putting more and more emphasis on keeping those parameters as small as possible, right? Um, 
So the, the way to get kind of a feel, so, so what, you, what you want to do is find values for alpha that look like it's not overfitting, right? Another thing that, that I may or may not talk emphasized enough in our lecture materials last time is that um, if, you don't, if, if you don't have your alpha value high enough, um, you're going to see that your test, your, your training um, curve for the learning curve will go up a lot higher than, than what we were seeing when we're overfitting here, right? So, so this might be a little bit too high because it actually does uh, end up with a Ruby RMSE of about 0.4 before it gets back down to close to what we were getting before there, right? So, so, so doing this overfitting first is good uh, when you're exploring parameters like this, uh, because that also might tell you that um, um, maybe my, my value is too high here, right? Um, so, um, so, so I, I just said it was maybe too high, but um, let's see, like, uh, like uh, what happens if we get like 1.1 1 .1. Well, there, you know, I mean, it looks like we're overfitting still, I mean, at least until we get down to here, plus, you know, we get that troublesome thing for the, the, the curve for the training data, you know, it goes up there and it never gets very good, you know, so even once we get to our 80% of the data for our uh, validation testing uh, is still above 0. 0.4 here, right? So, so those are both indications that it's really too high. We, we, we probably want something lower. We, we, we want to get um, the, the, the training curve here back down to that 0. 0.25, 0. 0.28 range, right? As well as uh, see if the validation um, will come back more quickly um, instead of having a big gap there, right? Um, So we might try 0 0.1. So, so here, maybe 0 0.1 is even still a bit big because it did go above 0.4 before it came back down there a bit, but, but at least our gap closed much quicker there, which is kind of a good sign, right? So, so we are fighting overfitting more quickly, right? So, so that's another thing you can kind of tell from this. Um, so when you're playing around with regularization, um, you're, you're hoping to affect that. So the faster these, these close the gap, um, the better you're probably fitting the overfitting. Um, you're, you're, you're fighting the overfitting and um, um, getting a model that generalizes better, right? We can maybe keep going, so maybe 0 0.01, right? So now here, notice that this looks much better for the, the training data. So this looks like it was before. Um, so that, that's not a bad value. So somewhere, some, somewhere maybe the point between 0 0.01 and 0 0.1, or a little actually, I mean, you know, maybe even smaller. Um, you know. So what we would like to see now though is to try and, and, and get um, our, our validation model to get down there as close as we can to um, what we achieve with the training um, performance, right? Um, so yeah. So anyway, I mean, hopefully people tried that out kind of on their own. So you can see that that uh, I mean, there's so so at some point um, um, maybe we're doing worse again. Although values less than 0 0.01 seem like we're going to get some results. Although we have some effects on on um, how long the gap there. So it's a, I mean, you know, to me it was looking like 0 0.1 to 0 0.01, kind of doing this ad hoc and by hand to explore these. Um, we're getting pretty good results. And, and as usual, you know, when you rerun them, sometimes you can get, you know, so there's some randomness that happens here. So, but, but that's not bad, like 005, there are one here. Right. So notice now on our validation, so we're seeing now that, that we've got evidence that we can reach you know, whatever that is. And again, maybe I should have had you guys um, print that out, not just the, the R2 score. So let's, let's see what we're getting for those. Um, 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 uh, so I did ask to, to, to display the coefficients and things. Um, So if we want to calculate the, the mean squared error, I mean, we can do kind of the same thing that we did up in the, um, 
uh, functional mode. So, I mean, one thing we could do is calculate this by hand. So, um, so if we get the values of our predictions from the model, um, and then we um, use the mean squared error function to, to um, calculate the mean squared error between our predictions and um, our actual labels, then we can calculate those by hand, right? So, So in this case, um, uh, my model name is um, bridge regression here. Um, well, I need to append the other one. I calculate one of the mean square error here. So. Um, We'll just do it over all the data. Okay. Get that right. It means square error. Quotes matched correctly. And I'm using lower X, I think. Yeah, just lower X and lower Y for. So, so yeah, we're reaching something like uh, 0.32. Um, although, again, yeah, yeah, I mean, this is a little unfair because now I've kind of peeked into the box. So, the, the model that was trained um, at the end on 80% of the data, we now reuse it on the, the whole data. So the 80% was trained with plus 20% that it wasn't trained with. So, so I guess that um, um, if I wanted to get what I was getting on the validation, since we were always using the last 20% uh, for the, the validation, you know, the last, the end of the array for the validation, we could just get the, the values from approximately 80 and so put a slice in there. Um, it should just be the, 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 val the, the, the data that we were validating with right at the very end here, I believe. I need to do the same thing. So when I did that, I just got back 20 predictions. So I need the, the 20 labels at the end here. Three, three. So what was it before? I forgot, but um, three, three there. So if I haven't mentioned, I mean, you know, feel free if people have questions that are on here. Um, uh, let me know here. I'll get my chat up just in case anybody wants to ask things while we're talking about stuff. Make sure I didn't miss anything here. Okay. Um, All right, so maybe something to keep in mind. So we had a, a root mean squared error, squared error um, of about 0.33, which corresponds to the mean squared error of, you know, the, the square of that. So, um, one more approximately, one, one, four. Um, All right, so that's kind of an important, you know, so that was kind of what we achieved here with whatever my final value of alpha was for the regularization um, here. So remember the L2 norm, um, 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 I mean, you can kind of see it by looking at the parameters. So it, it tends not to drive the parameters to zero. So, so we still have uh, some estimation for all 20 of the uh, features that we currently have in our 20 degree polynomial model that we're trying to fit to this data here, right? Um, so the next 
Part five then was pretty similar, but to use the L1 norm or the lasso um, regularization. So um, again, remember that um, lasso regularization um, um, or the, the L1 regularization, that uses the absolute value. So L2 uses the square of the values and the L1 uses the absolute value. And uh, for reasons that we didn't really go into, but, but um, you know, um, it's really not that important that, that you understand um, that, that. So when you do the absolute value, it is more likely to drive things to zero. So another very common use of the L1 norm, like we talked about is to, um, um, to actually do feature importance, right? Because if you, if you use like a high L1 norm, uh, the features that, that go to zero or get kind of below some threshold close to zero, um, uh, you can think of those as being um, by the re regularization, by the L1 regularization as uh, indications that they're not that important um, to make it a model that, that, that does well for predicting the data, right? Well, that's a common way of doing what's known as feature selection is using like an L1 um, um, regression um, um, or using L1 regularization, whether it's regression or, um, um, or a classification problem. You can do it for both. So, it, um, so we'll talk about in this week's materials. I mean, you can use regularization on uh, uh, if you're doing a regression problem. So predicting a real value number, or if you're doing classification problems, you can do, use the same um, regularization, um, you know, if you're doing a binary classifier or a multi-class classifier. So, um, so again, you know, I, I, I wish I would have made it clear that I kind of wanted to see people trying these. I did, I mean, a few people did this and, and very good for you if you did it, you know, so actually showed me um, some say ad hoc or even more systematic um, explorations of the alpha parameter space to, to, to try and get a, a feel for what a good value might be of alpha for reg regularization. So in particular, I saw a few people, you know, do a little bit more of a more regular, uh, more systematic exploration of the alpha for the lasso regularization. So for example, putting a loop in with different levels of, um, of, of alpha, um, and then maybe even having like a, a defining a threshold um, and then finding which parameters were above or below that threshold to make estimates of, of how many parameters seem important, you know, how, how many features you would select um, under different conditions and different amounts of alpha. So, but, you know, all that, you know, you could have done uh, the same way. There, there was, uh, there were some descriptions here. Um, um, you will get some messages about um, um, some warnings here. Um, although if you set the max iterations and tolerance, you can kind of suppress those for the most part. Um, so here we're using alpha 0 0.01 again. So yeah, that was the, the message that I was talking about here. So, uh, so anyway, yeah, that, that was, again, was a pretty good value um, that, that uh, I saw here. Well, although, um, as I'll later describe, it turns out that, um, at least in terms of looking at the learning curves, um, really using no L1 regularization tends to get the, 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 the best performance. So, so, which means that just using regular linear, linear regression, um, Although, yeah, that can't be quite right because um, um, if you did it with none, it would, it would be um, reverting back to linear regression. So, and, uh, yeah, so I'll take that back. So maybe I'm um, think about that because when I come later on here, there'll be something that, that has a slightly different conclusion maybe. But, um, but, but uh, anyway, yeah, point zero one looks pretty good on that. Um, and, and, you know, we can try bigger values like, Say 1.0 on the alpha, um, and which will, yeah, I mean, yeah, we're seeing uh, we have to limit our range here. Um, uh, 
Now, in this case, the validation data, we were never, never, never able to see it. So that's way too big, right? So um, uh, maybe I need to get rid of this limitation to understand what's happening. So by, by um, limiting the Y range to, to zero to one, uh, everything must be happening above that. So we can't really see. So I'm gonna have to do that to, oh, well, that's not as bad as I thought, but, but um, um, yeah, so, so when it's too big here, notice that uh, it, um, um, it's I mean, kind of hard to say. I mean, it doesn't look like we're overfitting, but the problem is we know that you can do much better on the, the mean squared error, right? So, so our training mean squared error is too high here, right? Um, so um, in, in this instance, the, the, the alpha is too high. And so we're not getting good performance for either the training or the validation data anywhere near the, what we know we could be getting uh, for this particular set of data here. So, um, The zero point one. Uh, oh yeah, I mean again, that's that still seems too high. I mean again, because we know that um, from our previous explorations, that we'll be able to get RMSEs below, you know, around point four, um, um, or, or point three actually, and, uh, you know, below point three on the test, uh, and around point three or point three 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 four on, on the validation here, right? So. Um, so it's probably still a bit high. Well, something like that is maybe getting there, although that looks a little high still. There we go. So that might not be bad. So, uh, but. Um, Another thing we can do though is look at the effect on the parameters. So if we're just using this to figure out um, feature selection, so figure out the importance of these features, in that case, we might want to use higher values of the um, alpha um, uh, you know, to try and drive these down closer to zero to get some feeling for which parameters might be important and which one's not um, in our um, degree 20 polynomial here. So, uh, let me... Um, Let's see what I was getting, and we and and you know when you're doing ad hoc stuff like this or doing it by hand, you know, um, I, I you know I might have been better off to, to do this model multiple times with different values of alpha, um, so I can kind of keep track of kind of what we're achieving here. So, um, da, 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 although I need to change my model name and glass over direction here, it's a common error. In fact. Um, I don't know if I was checking that closely enough. So we been doing the same thing I was doing before, but I call my model lasso regression this time. So I should need that. Yeah. But yeah, this is getting a 0.36. This wasn't really doing quite as good as, um, as we were doing there for the um, rig regression, rig, rig regularization. It's probably even smaller. So, um, point three five. Um, but, but yeah, so I mean, in general, even though um, the learning curves might not be, if you just look at the results for the, um, squared error, you'll see it going down. So now we're down to 0.33. Um, um, we have a very small amount of alpha here. Uh, yeah, when you get it too small, you start getting um, the uh, convergence warnings. Um, let me just, I don't really want to deal with that right now. So let's, let's go back on this a bit. Right, uh, but um, anyway, before I move on, let's 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 go back up to something kind of significant. So let's try let's say point two. Uh, so again, this isn't uh, a very good regularization parameter here, 
um, I mean, you know, because as we know, looking at performance, but it still might be useful. Um, so it, it was it was probably too big. Um, um, well, um, yeah. So so I, so I should be careful here, right? So it basically drove all but the x the power one and x squared parameters to zero, right? Um, but in this case, uh, I'm, I'm maybe you know, so this might not be clear when you don't really know what your underlying data is. You know, what, what's driving your underlying data, right? So you could do something like this and not know that you're doing too much. But but yeah, in this case, I I, I shouldn't have used quite so high of a value just from looking at this. Also, I want to kind of use a value of alpha that still gets us around like the the, the point three three or at least down around 0.4, below 0.5 um, on the validation data, but also seems to be dropping or at least getting some of these parameters down to zero to get a feel for which features are important and which aren't, right? Like point 0.1 then. It's a pretty too high, so let's try point zero. Let's look at that, so the, the point zero 0.01, well, that's about maybe what I want. So we can see that um, 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 we already dropped the x cubed next to the fourth, came out to zero, but we have a significant value for here and here. But yeah, I mean, looking at that, I might estimate, you know, and then, but nothing after this is, is close to one. Um, although, um, so, so this is the um, uh, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, six and eight, right? So, so, so it's looking like maybe, you know, the degree eight polynomial, maybe degree six, right? kind of looking at the, you know, if possible. If, if, you know, if we weren't doing this as, as a polynomial of generating these, this, this would just be um, a particular feature. So we might want to drop any feature that's zero or close to zero um, if we're using this for feature selection here. So. Right. But yeah, I mean, that's a pretty, pretty common. There, there's lots of different ways you can do feature selection that people have come up with, but this was one of the simplest and one of the first was doing um, an L1 regularization. You drive features to zero and then, and then examining those and dropping ones that aren't significant enough, that are, that are too close to zero, which is an indication they're probably not useful for the model prediction, as long as, you know, like, like I was doing here, as long as you, you kind of balance your, your alpha appropriately so that you don't drop too much, right? Um, all right. So that gets us to the last one here. So I kind of, I mean, what I wanted people to do was kind of like the stuff that I was talking about, especially for the part four and five, right? So, so from that, you know, we might have a feel that um, when I later on ask here that, that we might want to use like a degree eight polynomial or something like that, degree seven, um, you know, eight or six was what I kind of said from looking at the so, so let's maybe use degree eight and see what we can get. In my example notebook, I'd pick six. You know, um, doing this ad hoc like this, um, um, you may or may not, you know, um, have real good arguments or support for why you pick a particular thing. But you know, if we're being conservative, I could at least drop um, the. Um, you know, the, the parameters above 13 or something like that, looking at this, but that's probably too much. Um, 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 so, oh, actually, I, I guess that I'd kind of been, been prompting you to try and estimate the polynomial degree using the um,
Um, let's see, what was I saying on, on part six here? So um, um, we really should have been using the uh, L1 regularization. So did I do this wrong here? Or did it become a bad example? Um, That's probably not a bad, bad value for um, the L2 regularization, although here yeah, we use a degree six model in the example solution here. Um, Uh, how I hid the hid the uh, up there again. Um, No, um, yeah, maybe I don't need that. Let, let's let me just do the rest of these here. So, um, So I have to go back and look through my uh, discussion of, of, of the stuff before this, but, but you know, the, the, the general thing here, I mean, you didn't have, you didn't know what the true function is. So I'm doing some stuff here that you couldn't have done to kind of illustrate. So uh, you might want to go back and try it on your own to, to see, uh, to kind of visualize how well your data fit um, with the, the true function that was being used. So um, again, all I'm, I'm plotting here was the, uh, I guess the, um, the degree six um, that we've done with the um, ridge regression and a little bit of alpha up here. So you can also compare the, the, the coefficients, right? So, um, so the true coefficients from the bias term up were five minus four, five minus one, minus two, six, right? So we can see, so this would have been five minus four, five minus one, minus two, Okay, and I, and, uh, degree six is, is a, an overestimate of just one in this case. So there's one more term, but yeah. Uh, um, five minus four, five minus two, that one's a bit off, that one, minus one and then six. So you can kind of see the, 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 it's beginning to get there. It's pulling out what the true, it's getting, getting close to what those true parameters are. And, and you know, in, in better ways, you can see that, I mean, if you didn't have all those correct, you wouldn't get, quite so good of agreement between um, the true function and this model that, that I'd shown there. So. Well, I mean, that, that's, it, as, as an aside here, I mean, that's what you're really trying to do whenever you do machine learning, right? I mean, you're, you're trying to, to, to make a model that will fit the true function that generate the data, but, in the real world for the real data, you, you'll never know what the true function is, right? So, so you'll have to use indirect things to try and, um, to try and um, uh, tell you know, whether you're getting close or not um, to your failure. But but for, for this assignment, um, this is kind of your one chance with, with kind of made up data like this to, to see how well, you know, how close you got to that true function that was, that was really creating data that you were trying to build a machine learning model of. Um,
Oh, and uh, well, I should I should probably also um, post this as well. So I mean, another test is if I generate uh, some additional data um, using that that generation function. So, so a good thing to do also on your model, you, if you don't want to go back and replot it, but see what um, the uh, root mean square error that you were getting on this additional test data. So this data you never had. So there's no way it could have been. Um, there's no way it could have been, um, you know, influencing the, the model choices that you were making to try and fit your model um, to, to the hundred data points that you were given. This, this is a good test, seeing what uh, R, what, what root mean squared error you can achieve um, on this completely unseen test data. Right. But for that model that I kind of had in my um, first part of the example solution, it was getting about a point three zero for the root mean squared error. On this data here, zero two nine. Okay. Um, there's some more examples here. So you know, if you had determined that uh, that, that maybe it was degree three model, um, we could have create create a model um, still using some L two regression, um, but uh, but this is a little bit underpowered, right? Um, so yeah, I mean, in this case, I mean. You ought to be able to kind of tell that because um, our, our result for our, our validation is above the 0.4 there on, on the root mean squared error. Um, and we want to be, if you plot that out on the test data um, for the degree three model, you get quite a, a significant reduction in um, accuracy um, on your test data with that model. Like between, you plot it out, you can visually see that, that it's um, not fitting too well with only uh, all the fruit and so it's like that you would um, work with um, here. So, um, but yeah, I mean, in general, you know, so we're, we're probably, or, or I'm probably letting the uh, information because I, I tried as much as possible to to ignore what I knew about how the test data was was generated, um, but you know even so I might have still made too good of a guess of of what the number of features were right. Um, so it usually is much more common um, if you really don't know what your model is or which features are important to leave it a bit. Potentially overpowered, um, and then you know to try and tune your regularization correctly. Um, so it generalizes, right? So you know, just as an example, if we use a degree ten model um, with no regularization, um, this might be overfitting a bit. Although our final result looks fine here, um, looking at the final root mean squared error, and then and again we get back to the, the point three three, right? So we were getting about what we were getting for um, uh, the first one that I, um, oh no, that's not quite it. So yeah, we were getting 0 0.30. So it so wasn't quite doing as good as that one uh, here on our completely new test data. Yeah. Function looks pretty, pretty good, except for maybe down here at some of the extremes. That's a common thing on models like this, that the, um, uh, you get real problems on the extreme ends. So, um, but yeah, if we add some regularization, we can probably improve on that. So, so do the same thing with, with 10 degrees of freedom, but uh, uh, put in some regularization in order to fight uh, the overfitting and try and, and uh, get our um, um, performance. As good as we can in here, right? So that's what we're doing on this example. Um, and and yeah, so we didn't quite get to the point three zero, but but yeah, we have a point three one seven here on, on, on the test data. Right? Um, all right. Um, and um, I don't have too much more, but um, let me go and take a little break here. I need to go um, uh, take a quick break. So, so let me pause for five minutes or so, um, and then...
um, and then we'll come back and we'll finish this up. And then I'll also talk a little bit about our materials for this week as well, so, and see if there's any questions on things. So. All right, um, let me, let's go ahead and start again here. So I don't have too much longer on going over assignment three here. Um, you know, as usual, if you like, chat out any questions or chat out any questions at the end about things, if you want to know more about this stuff. Um, um, this wasn't part of the assignment, so this is really kind of more new material here. But I wanted to, that this is a good place to review this. So right after you did the assignment, you might now understand why you might want to have the ability to more systematically um, explore like meta parameters for a machine learning model, like our ridge, like the alpha for the ridge regression or, or whatever, right? Um, uh, because uh, those are the things that are most directly affecting how well our model is going to perform um, uh, on this assignment, right? So for other machine learning methods we'll look at, at uh, I mean, there'll, there'll be a lot more other meta parameters in addition to things like regularization parameters and stuff like that. So, but, uh, um, this is kind of a general concept. And uh, the scikit-learn framework has things for um, doing this in a more systematic way. Uh, it has grid searches, has other kinds of more uh, randomized searches and things like that. So, 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 so the idea though, you know, for grid search is uh, instead of me like ad hoc trying a bunch of different values of, of alpha, uh, maybe putting in a, in a notebook like this, you know, 10 different values of alpha that I try in order to like, compare them um, to more systematically allow me to give it an array, some a range of alphas for it to search, all right? So the basic way that, that a grid search works, um, we're gonna be using a, a grid search cross-validation. Um, so the basic way it works is that you give it a range of parameters and it will create a model for all possible combinations of those parameters. Um, and it will, it will create a model and it will train it using uh, cross-validation. So in this case, it's gonna be training it using five-fold cross-validation in, in all the examples here. Um, and then you know, and it, it will figure out how well each model it trains does um, on that particular combination of uh, meta-parameters that it was using, right? And it, it, will, it will take the average of the five uh, cross-validation uh, training folds that we do here, all right, in this case, or the average of however many folds that you do, right? So some of these cells can take a little bit of time here, we'll see, but um, so let's say um, that for the L2 uh, ridge regression, that, that you wanted to more systematically explore um, the alpha value, right? And we saw, um, 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 in, case, in case you don't know what I'm doing here, um, log space works kind of like linear space, but it creates a, a, a set of values that are spaced in, in a logarithmic space, okay? And the first two parameters aren't like the, the begin and end value. These are the, the begin and end index for, for 10 to the power of that particular thing. So this is going to give me values um, in the log space from 10 to the minus 8, so very small, up to 10 to the 0, which is 1. Right. So we already saw for ridge regression that, that values above one uh, didn't work very well. Um, and we were finding, if I remember right, you know, values around 0.1 or was it 0.1 or 0.01? I'm not going to scroll back up. Um, uh, we're working well here. But um, um, so just to make certain that you understand what's, what's happening here. So alpha is just a NumPy array. Um, so, so the first one is going to be 10 to the minus 8. Uh, and then, the, then I, this, this, in this case, it creates 10 values that range from 10 to the minus 8 up to 1. And they're spaced, they're not spaced linearly, they're, they're spaced logarithmically uh, in the space here. And this, this is common when we need to, to search a large range of values to space them out logarithmic over there. So we get a good sampling for different, um, um, how do you say, for, for different um, uh, magnitudes, possible magnitudes here. So we're going get, to get a good sampling for different mag magnitudes of values from that range. So it's a pretty small up to one here. And in this case, we're, we're, we're creating an array 
of a thousand values, right? So um, that means that when, when we run the grid search, cross-validation is actually going to run a thousand cross-validations. It's, it's going to create and train a thousand models. It's actually going to create and train a thousand models uh, five times each. So it's going to do 5,000 training runs in this case. Um, where you know it does the, the the hold hold back one train with four fifths of the data uh, and then evaluate it on the one fifth hold back, so we'll get five trains for each one of these values of alpha that we pass in here, um, and it will it will remember the 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 mean uh, performance that it got. Okay. Oh, and and we're using the native mean square here because. Um, Grid search for some reason that I'm not 100% certain on. I didn't didn't take the time to Google it, but it 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 only optimizes. It only it only finds the maximum, right? So you have to give it scoring parameters that where the the largest value in the scoring um, measure that you give it uh, is the best, right? So, so normally when we've been using the root, root mean square error, we've been trying to minimize it, right? The smallest root mean squared error was the best um, performer. Um, but because of the way grid search works, we have to give it something that we're trying to op maximize um, for the optimization. So we can just, we can use the mean squared error, but we just take the negative of that. Okay, so in that case, the smallest, when you take the smallest mean squared error, when you take the negative of it, will become the largest. Right. Um, so by passing that in as the scoring function, um, it basically runs, instead of running the mean squared error, it runs the negative mean squared error function. Um, you know, so it trains the model, finds the predictions on the model for the um, um, held back fold, calculates the negative mean squared error, um, and it records that. Um, so I'm not certain if the documentation so these are the different kinds of scoring that you can use um uh, we have to look for the scoring parameter you can, you can try and um, score it using your own made up metrics or things like that uh, let's see here, where is this scoring parameter references at the bottom? So yeah, might not might not discuss why it needs to do a maximization here. Um, so you can you can Google that maybe if you're interested. I'm sure somebody somewhere gives an explanation for why um, you know, the grid search mostly uh, needs do it as a maximization problem to so find the maximum value. Um, so so notice I mean basically then we're passing in the. Um, um, uh, the, the, the model that we're going to do the grid search over, right? So, so we, we create a ridge model um, where, in this case, I can't remember why I, I decided, but I specified a particular solver for ridge um, and I gave it an initial random state here. Um, I don't, it's probably not necessary. I probably copied this from an example or something like that. So. Um, so we can just use a default ridge here. So by default, it should be using um, for the solver. That that's that's the optimizer. Um, oh, so it uses auto uh, by default for the um, solver. Um, let's leave it at auto there. Yeah. Um, and notice then we pass in this. The, the parameters has to be a dictionary. Uh, and the dictionary that the keys have to be keys, the, the keys have to correspond to um, a parameter name. So in this case, you know, the, the parameter name is alpha. So if we use the key alpha, it's gonna, it's gonna search, you know, it's gonna do the grid search using all these different values of alphas that we pass in as the array, you know, in the grid search. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. That's what the parameter is. 
And, and as we'll see here in a bit, I mean, you can pass in multiple parameters for the grid search here, right? So, it, so I could have a second. <laughs> I thought it was important. Um, to try two different solvers instead of using auto, I could try S, the, the um, um, solver optimizers here, like. Um, CB and re squared or something like that. Um, and so that's an example. Uh, we'll, we'll get another example of that later. I'm gonna I'm not gonna do that right now. So that's what's happening there, right? Um, and then these others are um, parameters for the grid search object itself. So how many cross validation folds to do um, and what scoring mechanism to do to evaluate and compare all the different models that we're going to build um, in this grid search here. All right. Um, and then, yeah, so this is, I mean, grid search is a fit transformer. So by doing the fit um, and passing in um, a set of data, so we'll pass in um, our 20 degree polynomial data again with the, the Y labels. But in this case, we're, we're passing in all 100 data points as inputs and all 100 labels, right? So we'll do the cross validation by splitting it into 80, 20, um, five times. Um, I don't want to do this here. What you'll see is that um, once you do the, um, the, the fit transform here, there's lots of things that you can call then on, on a fit um, grid search object. Um, but and so I'll just go from them in, so the most common. Um, oh, and some of these might take some time here. So, um, especially in our last one, I might not be able to wait here. So, um, but I mean, there's a thousand alphas that we went through there, but it didn't take that long, right? So notice it found, um, so yeah, I think the, the one that I kind of had found by hand was 0 0.01 or something above here. Um, um, so notice, that, so, so the best params that it found was an alpha value of close to 0 0.01, so 0 0.009, right? And that came up with a, the, the score is our negative root mean squared error, right? So that's the negative point one one. So again, remember that that's the negative, that's the, the root mean squared error. So, you know, if you want to compare that to what we were using before, the, uh, I'm sorry, that, that's the negative mean squared error, right? It's not the root mean squared error. So if I want to compare that to what we had before, I'd have to, um, negative and um, um, then the square root of that. So something like that, right? right. So if we take the negative, we'll get the, the mean squared error. And if we take the, the square root, we'll get the root mean squared error, right? So that'd be, this, this could put it back. I probably should put this into my, um, uh, example here, but um, so, yeah, they'll have to rerun the whole thing there. So if I do this again below, I should probably do that. Not in the same cell where I'm running the grid search in here, so, um, where I'm fitting. So, so it actually does the work to run all the models when you fit. There. So, so yeah, the best we were getting in that case was 0.33. You know? So remember, we did find something close to I'm going to go back up and look at that here, remind myself. So, um, an example solution here. Um, so, yeah, for our ridge, so I got pretty much about the same result there, uh, which, which makes sense because I'm using about the same um, alpha up here. 0.005 in this case, but, but yeah, 0 0.3389. 0 0.338, 0 0.337 is the best that we've really seen so far. Um, um, well, the last not sure. We did, we did get down to 0 0.30 um, um, when we started fitting uh, the models here. Um, So there we go, we did that. Um, so 
when you're doing bridge just like this, it's often useful to be able to visualize how that meta parameter or how multiple metal parameters are affecting the scoring metric that we're searching over, right? So here, when we have just a single meta parameter, I can easily plot the alphas against the scores, okay? So the, the scores, uh, we just pull off. Um, so here, um, the, the that fit grid cross-validation model has a bunch of things you can do. So there's another thing. So it actually has a dictionary um, of things, of, of results. So for example, I can pull out the, the mean test scores. Um, we have, so that's gonna be the mean for the, from the cross-validation of the negative mean squared error here, a mean of a mean in this case. Right? We're just plotting those um, uh, here along the whole range of the alphas that we tested. Okay, so now we're, we're seeing all of the values that we tested here. So from 10 to the minus eight up to 10 to the zero or, or one, right? So we can see that um, uh, uh, really the, the best, the, the place where we're getting a negative mean squared error of that 0.11, which corresponds to the 0.33 root, root mean squared error. Um, you know, again, so now we're, we're, we're maximizing. So, so higher values are better on this plot. Um, so, some, so, so basically, you know, this is telling us you know, somewhere between 10 to the minus five and 10 to the minus one um, is, is our best range. And then, yeah, our best one was right there close to uh, 10 to the minus two. Point, um, point, uh, point, point, Zero one, ten to the minus two, or close to it. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> um, for some reason that I'm not too certain of, uh, Ridge cross validation uh, actually allows you to do that grid search directly just with the Ridge uh, CV object. Right, so you can pass in instead of passing in alpha, you can pass in alpha, so a range of alphas. Um, and it's essentially doing the same thing. You can also pass in. I mean, I, I think it does that because uh, uh, Ridge, and um, I assume that maybe Lasso does this as well. Kind of has a built in for doing a, a grid search over the alphas, and so it's a very common thing. I mean, that's that's the thing that you're often most wanting to, to know about is kind of what the best amount of regularization is if I'm doing lasso or ridge regression. So we've gotten basically about the same result there. And we did get this exactly the same it looks like. So. Um, all right, so we can do the same thing with the L1. So maybe I'll just kind of go through this here. Um, um, so here, again, we're doing it from 10 to the minus 8 to 10 to the 0. Um, and the 1,000 values of alphas. Remember, before, I, I mentioned that the, it looked like um, for the uh, L1 norm, not the regression, but the, that basically uh, it was performing best when we didn't use any um, there are very small values. Um, and in fact, yeah, that's what that is. So it's a but whenever you get back that the best that you find on a grid search is one end of your range or the other, uh, it might mean that uh, you know you need to you need to do it again, but but extend your range down, uh, you know, even further below. But in this case, um, I mean, it's pretty much telling us that um, like if we try ten to the minus fifteen, we just get ten to the minus fifteen um, again there. So it's telling us that the lasso um, regression doesn't seem to be doing much for us. And then back we get at the 0.166 here, uh, negative 0.166, right? Go back and look. Um, I might have to go back and check that because that might not be consistent with what I was seeing when I was trying to do it by hand. Let's check that out. Um, 
most likely it's because um, we're doing um, something different with parameters here or something. So with, with the meta parameters for the, the last uh, meta parameters other than alpha. So. But yeah, that's a, that's a mystery. Um, something that, that I ought to um, explore a little bit more. But anyway, it's not really that important here. So um, so in this case, if we plot it again, you'll see that um, basically anything below 2 to 10 to the minus 2 or 10 to the minus 3 is getting some So, so um, what we might really be interested in on this problem is to more systematically determine the number of, of, of the, the, the polynomial degree, okay? So, so the, the, the features um, that are best um, to use for fitting good models for, the, for this data. Um, so this is a little bit more advanced example, but to do that, uh, we, we have to write kind of a helper function that will create pipelines because we want to do a grid search. Uh, we want to pass in uh, parameters. So in this case, we're going to pass in parameters for degrees two up to 100. Okay, so I'm, I'm actually going to search uh, polynomial functions whose degrees range from two to 100, right? Now I, I make up um, of this, so notice here, uh, there's two underscores here. So whenever you're using a pipeline for a grid search, you can actually send in parameters into the grid search for different parts of the pipeline. So my pipeline has two things, the, the polynomial features and the actual linear regression object. Right? In this case, we're not doing any um, I mean, regularization. We're just going to the four polynomial degrees, right, from two to one hundred, right. But when you have a pipeline, uh, I can still grid search over different metaparameters for different parts of the pipeline with this kind of trick. Okay, so and I think it normally works like this. So if you have objects, normally we use camel case for the object names in Scikit-Learn, but um, um, here, like like it shows, um, you, you should just hence form that to all lowercase, to pick out the, the named object in the pipeline, then you have to have two underscores, and then you use the parameter name. So in this case, um, polynomial features, we want to set the degree to be the particular degree in the grid search, right? Um, and as we'll see, I mean, we can also do things. Um, so later on um, in this example, we will also uh, do both the degree of the polynomial and do some regularization on alpha, right? So it passes in both the same time simultaneously on a grid search. Um, all right, and then we do that, but otherwise it would, about the same as we did before. So we use the negative mean squared error with a five-fold cross-validation. Um, and we'll see, so notice we're getting a, a mean squared error is the best one that we've seen so far, 0.10, or, or, or um, at least as good as the best one we've seen, if not slightly better, right? Um, and it's showing that the best polynomial degree comes up at a degree five polynomial seems to be doing the best for the model. And here, the visualization is especially important. Um, although, yeah, if you plot the whole range, again, this is another example of, you know, this visualization doesn't really help because, I mean, all this is telling me is that anything below 50 um, or above 50 degree polynomial begins to break down. In fact, this, this um, x or y axis goes up 10 to the power of 20 here. And so this stuff really um, d is disastrously bad on, on the mean squared error when you get the, the degree too high. And, and in fact, you know, because um, the scale is so big, most likely, I mean, something even, you can't see it, but, but it probably is really bad somewhere even around 20 or 30 or so. So in fact, we, we want to um, um, plot that just from a, a smaller range to get a feel for, um, here, right? So, for example, if we plot it from 2 to 11, I want to make it a little bit bigger so you can see it up to, um, so that, that gets us um, in my array here. Um, that, that corresponded to a degree 4 polynomial up to a degree um, 12 polynomial. 
expand this just a little bit. Uh, let's go up to maybe even a bit higher. So. That was too high. So now at this point, we had something that was so bad uh, that it squashed the stuff. We can't see the information anymore. At least what I'm trying to discover from this visualization here. So that's, that's probably a pretty good one. So um, I mean, at this point, I mean, you can clearly see that that four or, or smaller does. There does seem to be a significant. Um, Jump and improvement between oops, between um, a degree four model and a degree five, which makes sense because this was actually a degree five model, right? So so fours were a little bit underpowered or smaller, right? They could never do anything. Now, um, if you have a bit of an overpowered model, it doesn't you know all the way down to degree ten or maybe maybe you know, a little more conservatively, like degree seven or so. Right, so, so so definitely five might be the best, um, or somewhere between five and ten, or five and seven or eight. Looking at um, this grid search um, uh, here, right? So. Um, so as the final example here, I want to wrap up. Um, although I'm probably going to. Um, uh, the cell could take, well, I mean, you know, maybe a minute or two to run here because this is an example of doing a grid search over multiple parameters. Okay, so we're going to, to look at all degrees from two to 40 for the polynomial, but we're going to do some um, ridge regression. So um, we're going to see that, that maybe a slightly higher powered model, but adding in some regression. So we'll, we'll put in some alpha. Uh, 10 to the minus 8 to 10 to the minus 1. Right? And since I have 40 of these, or well, 38, call it 40 degrees, and then 100 alphas, that, that's actually 4,000 parameters on the grid search, right? Uh, and then if I add in, if, I, if, if for some reason I want to check different solvers to see if that made a difference, I added in like six possible solvers. So alpha and solver are um, meta parameters for the ridge object of the. Um, of this pipeline that we're going to be using in this grid search. So we use ridge underscore underscore alpha uh, for the grid search parameters for that one and ridge underscore underscore solver for those parameters. And, and then, you know, the name of this first transformer in the pipeline is polynomial feature. So we use polynomial feature underscore, or underscore degree for that kind of parameter. Um, so this would actually make it up to 24,000 models each each model doing a five fold cross validation. So multiply that by five again, right? Um, but uh, you don't really get much of a boost from using a different solver. So let me go ahead and just do it with the um, 4,000 here. I can put two on, I'll think. Um, oh, all right. I'll take a little bit of time. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah, but yeah, it doesn't actually do it until we, we do the fits. It doesn't actually do all the cross validations until we, we, we fit our model with our data. Um, so it's well, 30 seconds or so here. Oh, my machine, uh, my, my machine's pretty beefy, um, so it could take a little more significant time on your machine, but I wouldn't expect it more than a few minutes or so. For most people's desktops or laptops here. Yeah. So it's still following the polynomial uh, of degree five as the best model with um, about a 0 0.005 um, um, alpha using the ridge regression here. Right. So that corresponds to about 0 0.3011 for the root mean squared error here. Which I believe is probably the best, although it's marginally better than some of the stuff that we found by hand. But it's it's as good, if not the, the best, slightly than anything else um, I show in this notebook here. So. Yeah, we can visualize the fit there from the model. So. All right. So anyway, we'll, we'll probably be seeing more examples of that and using more of that. So, you know, it takes um, 
Um, green searches are pretty powerful. So, so once you understand them, um, you'll be using them a lot, especially for, for kind of standard machine learning model, because so it's very common that um, I know I want to try a particular model, but um, um, I need to do some exploration of different metaparameters of the model um, to get a feel for what's going to work to, to, for my model to perform well, right? But grid search with cross-validation is, is, you know, kind of pretty standard um, approach to doing that. All right, anybody want to ask any questions? Still with me here? All right, so that was assignment three. Um, so I think I already mentioned at the beginning, but but uh, people hadn't really joined me yet. Um, so so we are we do have kind of one more week of materials here. So we're going to go and look at um, classification in more detail. So so using. Um, um, instead of linear regression or, you know, uh, linear regression with regularization. Now we're looking at logistic regression, which we've mentioned before um, is a confusing name because um, this is our most, this is our simplest mechanism for doing classification problems, okay? So for, for this week seven material, we, we jump to looking at um, um, uh, uh, how classification works, right? Um, although this is still the, the chapter four from our um, hand on machine learning. Um, um, uh, here. Um, um, all right. Oh, and there's a, lots of good things from the Dr. E. Ings um, um, class. Um, uh, that, that we're touching on with the logistic regression stuff here. So I also encourage you to go and look at his videos as well. Um, um, although, I mean, most of these, hopefully I've been listing these for the last couple of weeks. So we're down to, you know, we really talked a lot of details about the, um, the cost function and, um, you know, cost and fitness function and, and um, the gradient descent optimization. That was kind of last week, last two weeks. So, so we're, we're kind of down here, well, um, and, and regularization. So we're down here really to talking about logistic regression. You know. um, anyway. So I just rerun all the cells. Um, so, the main thing about logistic regression is um, I mean, it's going to look very, it's going to look pretty much exactly the same as the linear regression in terms of the definition of the. Um, how the model works for um, um, our cost function and stuff. I'm sorry, not for the cost function, but but um, um, for gradient descent um, and things like that. But we use a slightly different form of the cost function. So this um, um, the, the the logistic function, um, also called the sigmoid function, right? So really, before. Um, Um, so, uh, uh, so this isn't the cost function. Sorry, did I say the cost function? Of the, so this is our function for um, generating the hypothesis. Right? So our function for generating the hypothesis for straightforward linear regression is just to multiply 
the x's times the theta parameters, okay? So, so that's that's a linear regression, right? So, so once you have some estimate for the theta parameters, you multiply them by the whatever the value is of x for each of the features. Uh, and, and basically this is a matrix multiplication, so it does a sum. Um, so, so it multiplies each value and sums them up. And that, that's your hypothesis, right? So for logistic regression, we have to remember, so uh, the output that we want for logistic regression isn't like a number, um, uh, you know, so a real value number, like predicting the, the price of the house from, our, from the features that we use as input, right? So for um, logistic, for, for a, a classification problem, the output we're gonna try and be predicting is gonna be a, a class, okay? So we're gonna start off just talking about binary classification, right? So in that case, we've only got two classes. So the output, the label is gonna be either zero or one, right? So we need to have a, a modified form of the function that, um, uh, you know, takes the, the, the features, multiplies the, the, the inputs, multiplies those times our parameters for the model, Right, but then needs to do some sort of transformation to get a result uh, that's zero or one, right? Uh, for a binary classification, so, so zero one, true, false, yes, no, right? So that's why we use the sigmoid function. The sigmoid function gives um, looks like this, right? But whatever the value of z is um, or x, whatever you want to think of this, so whatever we have as input, it's going to squash the result. To some value between zero and one. So that, that's the, the, the primary reason why we're using the sigmoid function, because after you uh, do the, the, the normal thing we were doing before to multiply the inputs times the parameters, you put it through the sigmoid function, the result will be a value between zero and one. But it can be, it's not going to be exactly zero or exactly one. It's going to be some value in between there. Right? So for somewhere between, I mean, it actually never gets exactly to zero. So, so, so it only approaches zero asymptotically as you go to larger and larger negative numbers and approaches zero asymptotically. But effectively, once you're above like five, um, five or six, or negative five, negative six, it's pretty much um, <laughs> zero or one to, um, you know, uh, four or five digits, right? But within that range, it's gonna be some value between zero and one. Right. And if, if, if after you do the, the, the x's times the parameters and you sum those up, uh, you get a value zero, the, the result is gonna actually be zero when you go through the zigmoid, one, okay? So normally what we do, I mean, you can set what's known as like the, the cutoff where you want, but, but normally you can think of the cutoff as being set as a value of zero. So anything that ends up being below zero, we end up, uh, predicting that it's going to be um, a zero, or sorry, yeah, it ends up being below 0.5 um, on our sigmoid. So, so if we use a cutoff of 0.5, we'll make it as a prediction of zero. And notice that a cutoff of 0.5 corresponds to when the uh, when the sum of x times the theta parameters ends up being zero. So if if, if x times the theta, the, the sum of the x times the theta parameters is, is zero. Um, or less, zero or negative, um, we're going to be to this side of the sigmoid, and, and we'll end up, if we use 0.5 as our cutoff, we'll end up predicting zero, right? And if, if the, that sum ends up being greater than zero, so positive, um, uh, we'll end up with a result on the sigmoid that's greater than 0.5, so we'll predict a one in that case, right? So yeah, we use that cutoff basically, or, or standard cutoff. Although, you know, later on we'll talk about, you can, um, this is really what we were doing when we did the, um, 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 the, the precision recall, we were actually changing the value of this uh, cutoff value and seeing how that affected um, our false positives and true negatives, basically, right? So yeah, I mean, by, by modifying where we do the cutoff, like if we made it 0.2, then we'd have things, you know, more things would, would, we would classify as, you know, we'd predict as being one. So, um, anyway. So 
So for this modification for our hypothesis function, uh, we do have to use a different um, cost function as well. Um, the, 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 um, the basic um, mean squared error um, uh, won't work anymore. Um, so we have to use this version of the cost function. So just real quickly, why this works is because we use the negative log of our prediction. Um, so, so, but it depends on what what the uh, the true value is, right? So, if the true label is one, we use the negative log of the prediction, and if the true label is zero, we use the negative of one minus the prediction, right? So the reason why this works, so if, you, if, if you plot this out, so what the case when y is one, so when y is one, that means that we want to predict one, right? So we want our cost to be close to zero any time the prediction um, is one. And that's, that's what happens uh, here for this first part of this um, two-part um, um, cost function here, right? By taking the negative log of p, um, when it's one, we get values close to zero, and when it gets down here to zero, it rapidly, the, the cost rapidly increases, right? Because we're making a bad prediction in that case, right? So, so the true value is one, but we're but if the um, the sigmoid gets a value close to uh, zero, um, it's making a bad prediction, right? And the cost rapidly rises, right? But we have to flip that when the true, when the label is zero. So when the, um, um, uh, when the, the class is false or no, right? So, so the, the, the second part of this, if you take, just take one minus the prediction, um, you get the reverse of that. So, so again, if the true label is zero, whenever we're predicting close to zero, we want the cost to be zero. And if the true label is zero, but we're predicting, uh, sorry, our predictor is being close to one, um, we want that, that to be a, a high cost, right? Um, and then from that cost function, then, you know, um, um, it looks pretty similar to what we talked about previously for um, how we define our overall cost function. The overall cost function is just, you know, so for a particular set, current set of theta parameters, if we just sum up that cost function over all of our input values, um, you know, that we're training with, you know, we have M values that we're training with, we sum those up, that's our overall cost, right? And we take one, uh, one over M to take the average of those. So. Um, and you have to really worry about why it's negative there. Um, um, uh, one reason why we use the um, uh, the, the sigmoid and this uh, logistic cost function. Um, is that uh, this is nicely differentiable, like like the root mean squared error cost function is, right? And in fact, if you compare this to the the form that we had uh, for the root mean squared error, um, the, um, the the derivative of our cost function, it looks almost exactly the same. The only difference is that um, um, you know we take the sigmoid of this expression here. Um, um, you know, which, which again is in our, our sigmoid uh, function here, right? Otherwise, it ends up being identical. So that's kind of another reason why this is commonly used for logistic regression. Um, So, um, so this brings us back to the idea of decision boundaries, right? So what's happening when you train a model using logistic regression, you'll get the same thing. So you'll get estimates for the parameters for each of the features, but then we, we have to go through the sigmoid function, um, right? Um, but when you do that, um, Basically, because of where you choose 
you know, going back to this, but basically because of where you choose the cutoff, that's going to end up causing a hard uh, decision boundary to occur on your um, uh, your feature space for the model that you're trying to train. Okay? So, um, so examples of this, you know, to make this clear. So, like in this first example, we're using the well-known classification problem um, using the um, um, So flower data set, right? So in this case, actually, the 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 flower data set, um, uh, the iris data set. Sorry, that's usually called the iris data set. Um, was an example of a multi-class classification problem. So there's actually four classes. So there's Virginica. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to remember. I didn't look it up before I um, started looking. But, but there's actually four different classes. So we turn it into a um, a binary classification problem um, in this case by um, um, by yeah, having everything that was equal to type two, which was the Virginica, uh, be labeled as um, as a one, um, and everything else. It's labeled as a zero. Um, just to make this a simple binary classification. We also further simplify it in this example uh, to only use one feature as input. So in this case, you know, we create a, a logistic regression like you should be used to by now, and we fit it to our data, but um, X has simply one of the four. Um, feature. There, there, there's four classes as output, but there's actually um, um, four features in the iris data, uh, which is like pedal length, pedal width, um, and then the, the sepal length and sepal length width, which is another part of these irises that we're trying to make a classifier for here. So, so at its simplest, um, if, if you train the logistic classifier, um, you'll see that um, um, Basically, a decision boundary uh, happened, right? So, so these were actually the the um, instances by petal width of the things that were not vir Virginica flowers, and these were all of our instances um, in this data set that were Virginica. So the decision boundary doesn't make a perfect decision; it can't just with this one feature. And so a few things were misclassified by this decision boundary point. Um, Virginica that weren't, and a few things were classified as not Virginica that were, right? So that's the best it can make, presumably, um, with the, the, the data that we need here. Right? Um, but yeah, the location of this, this decision boundary um, comes about because of, you know, where we're using the cutoff, um, and we use 0.5 um, as the cutoff on our sigmoid function, right? And so basically, yeah, I mean, anything that ends up with a sigmoid of 0.5 or less um, is gonna end up over here. And, and what happens after we train the model was that that cutoff happened at about 1.6, uh, oh yeah, 1.66, or 1.66 centimeters for the feature um, um, ended up being, that, that place where the cutoff happened when we trained our logistic regression model. Um, but yeah, I mean, after that, I mean, you can do all the same things that we were doing with, with um, uh, linear regression, you know, so you can make predictions on values you haven't seen before uh, by calling the predict function. Um, you can do a binary uh, classification, uh, of course, on more than one feature. So, for example, we could we could use the first two features, pedal length and pedal width. See what we get. So here, if we want to visualize the decision boundary, um, of course, it's a harder visualization problem because we got two parameters. So we have to be able to plot basically uh, pedal length and pedal width, and then see. 
So, so the easiest thing you can do for a plot like this is just plot it and then uh, plot all the things use, using marker type is what we did here. So, so we use one marker type, well, we use marker type and marker color, right? So we plot um, all the things uh, using squares that for our train model that ended up being not Virginica and, and as triangles that ended up being Virginica. From that, you'll be able to um, kind of see where the um, decision boundary is. But if, but if you want to plot the exact decision boundary, you have to dig down into the model a little bit. So, so this is an example of, of pulling out the decision boundary. Um, for the, the, the classifier that we just built there. So. Um, so, I mean, I, I didn't really want to go too much in the details of this, um, but, um, you know, what we're kind of doing here then is um, we're really using a contour plot. So these end up being the contours uh, for different values. So, so the the the, dash, the the follow dash line is where we use 0.5. So that's the, the default sigmoid value that we use for a decision boundary between yes and no for a binary classifier. Um, but we, we can plot where that decision boundary would end up if we use different values of um, of um, Of, um, of the sigmoid um, um, to, uh, to move the decision boundary. Okay. But yeah, the most important one drew this one. So this is, this is the decision boundary that we actually uh, use um, for the standard logistic regression. So we're using 0.5 on the sigmoid uh, to divide these. Stuff. Um, So, um, so yeah, I mean, in this case, we were just doing binary classification, but you can generalize uh, logistic regression to use um, to do multi-class classification. Okay, um, so you can one approach, and, and I think we talk about it elsewhere. I mean, you can just build uh, multiple um, binary logistic um, classifiers. Um, so do kind of like we just did above here. So, so break it into Virginica, not Virginica, um, and um, you know, class two, not class two. You should really remember the other names, um, right? So in that case, build four different um, class of binary classifiers. And then in that case, you would combine them. So, um, so whichever one had the highest, um, Um, output uh, would be the one that you would pick as, as the class among those. Okay, so that's, I don't know, soft max regression is a um, um, a similar idea, but where we use a slightly different version of our um, um, prediction. Um, you know, our hypothesis generation, right? So, so we're, we're modifying our hypothesis generation to look like this. So we're still using the sigmoid, um, but um, you know, we're using this form here, right? Um, I mean, SK is still just, um, you know, X's times the thetas, whatever the current values of the thetas are. Okay. Um, so, and, and I, I mean, I go more into this on in the lecture video. Um, I'm not going to go really into the details of all of this here. Um, you um, create a, a cost function for this particular um, hypothesis. You know, modified form of the hypothesis 
Uh, we still are actually using, uh, we're using something called cross entropy, but this is really just a generalization of the, the, the first one that we showed above. Okay, so um, this is really doing pretty much the same thing, but for uh, more than two labels. Um, and so, so in this case, we assume that their labels are zero, one, two, three, up to however many different labels, but, but yeah, whole number um, uh, labels here. Um, or, or, uh, so that's not quite right. Um, really, what it will be is is that um, um, a zero or one, but we'll have four of those, uh, or one for each class, depending on how many classes we have. So for our iris, um, um, we're going to have uh, four things, which will be one for the class viz and zero for the others that is not, which is being used in this um, quantum degree. Um, So like I said, I mean, you know, you, you should watch the lecture video, um, a little bit more discussion, more detail on this. Um, but in terms of, of actually using, um, you know, doing, doing a multi-class um, classification problem, um, you can do it relatively easily. So, so if you just use a logistic regression, but you specify a uh, particular meta parameter, it'll use, for example, the um, the, the softmax regression um, that we're um, discussing up here um, directly to do the uh, multi-class um, classification fitting here. Um, So in this example, I guess it might have restricted it to only three of the four classes instead of all four, but even still, you know, so so um, can be even a tougher kind of problem to visualize. So in this case, I mean, there's ways to do it. So this is an example of pulling it out, um, um, and again using kind of that contour map um, idea. But um, but but from using a contour map um, 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 approach here, uh, we can get it so that it will uh, color in um, the boundaries that we get between the three classes, I guess, in this particular um, example, right? But but yeah, I mean, you know, even if you don't uh, quite get all of the the details of how these contours are being. Um, Plotted here using this mesh, mesh grid example. Um, hopefully, I mean, you know, I mean, at a most basic, uh, even if you didn't do any of the other stuff, you could always plot your classes um, on the uh, the two features in this case using marker shape or marker color to get a feel then of of um, all that space is being divided up, right? So you can see we had enough separation between the Satosa and the other two that, that we get kind of a, a perfect separation of these. You know, so these are all going to be classified correctly. Uh, but we had some overlap um, on these two features here. Um, so we, we get a few things that are going to be misclassified. All right. Um, yeah, that, that's kind of all I wanted to talk about here today. Um, so, as usual, um, I will go ahead and post this once I get a chance. Although I had an announcement, so um, you might want to read the announcement about the class help session. So there's been some um, pushback, and I might have to change the format of these a little bit. Basically, me, I might not might not be able to do all of these in Zoom sessions here. So, um, and the other thing is, yeah, I mean, so next week we are going to be doing our first test. So I, I plan to kind of just talk about the, the the format and kind of review things and see if people have any questions about the stuff they want to um, ask. So, but but yeah, if, if you want to start preparing for the first test after you look through this. Um, um, 
week seven's materials here, your best thing to do would be to look through the, the assignments um, and the, the lecture notebooks. Um, kind of review those things. You know. so the, the, the tests are going to be pretty similar to actually the assignments for this class. So I'll be giving you um, an I, uh, a notebook with questions um, like in our like these past two assignments um, and, and asking you to do some work uh, in those to um, you know, write code in order to solve problems or answer the questions. So, and you'll mostly be doing linear and logistic regressions um, with some data sets. Oh. All right, so that's it. Anybody want to ask a quick question or anything before we go here? Um, all right, well, um, then I'm going to go ahead and end the session. Everybody have a good day then. You know, send me um, um, emails if you have questions or anything like that. And I'll see you guys later then.